Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. <laughs> Wonderful to be back in the studio this morning after being out at the up-and-coming conference in Milwaukee. That's new co-ops being formed, and then I was on vacation last week. Back in the studio and just very excited about it. We are celebrating Women's History Month, the month of March. Last month, February, was Black History Month. And today in studio, we have a man, Mr. Mm -hmm. Julian Rowan, but he's here to talk about growing up in a co-op, and we're going to celebrate his mom, Nancy Rowan, and other women in a co-op in D.C. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you so much, Vernon, for having me on. Thank you for taking out the time to come in and share your history of growing up in a cooperative and celebrating a woman, a wonderful woman, Nancy Rowan, whom I've gotten to know over the years and have tremendous respect for. So the the sort of the theme for Women's History Month is visionary women, champions of peace and nonviolence. So we honor women who have used nonviolence to end wars and injustices uh, and using nonviolence to change our society. So that's the theme this year, and we'll See if we can touch on that with the women in Beecher Cooperative, which is a cooperative that Mr. Julian Rowan grew up in. So how was it, Julian, growing up in a co-op in D.C.? <laughs> it was uh, transformative, for sure, and, and f informative, certainly. Well, first, really honored to be on here. Um, the irony is not lost on me that having a man on to talk about women's history, but I also think it's and, and celebrating women, but it's also important for men to, to recognize, yep. you know, and um, both the struggles, but also how um, fierce and powerful women are in this city. And I was fortunate to, to be raised by one and raised by many, actually, at Beecher Cooperative. Um, and so that was, you know, w one thing is that um, I was exposed and felt like family to many really strong visionary women at the cooperative um, and many of whom I'm still in contact with. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So let's talk about Beecher first. Sure, sure. So tell us a little bit about the history of Beecher. When was it formed? Where is it? Yeah. Da, da, da. Sure. So uh, Beecher Cooperative was uh, formed back in 1979. And... Uh, Let's see. We've, you know, we've stayed underneath the radar. My mom's probably going to be a little bit embarrassed to hear me talking about this, and, and in part because, you know, this is really was a number of people who received an eviction notice on the Christmas Eve of 1977, okay, uh, told that they would have a certain number of days by which they would need to get out of their units, and they banded together. Um, and with some help from the city and with some <laughs> visionary women at the forefront, um, including people like Esther Siegel, my mom, Nancy Rowand, uh, people like Gretchen Wessel, um, who were at, in those buildings, they, they organized, got some great support from the city and bought out uh, the owner. Um, so two years later, 1979. Wait, wait. So, so I just want to go back. Sure. Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, yep. 77. 77, yep. I was about a year old. <laughs> my, okay. I would, so essentially, you know, my mom was raising uh, my sister. I have a twin sister. She was raising us both on her own at the time, right? She gets a vic uh, eviction notice. We all get eviction notices for the whole block. The, the, the owner of the property was going to tear down the buildings and put up a high rise, okay? And these are buildings that were built, you know, in the early 40s. Uh, three four-story buildings, really solid buildings built by the Army Corps of Engineers to support the war effort. So this was administrative housing. 
modest one bedrooms, but at that time they were, you know, perfect for that kind of thing. In Glover Park, so tucked near, uh, it's a, there's a beautiful park pathway to get down to the Potomac. You're near Georgetown, and there's uh, and it's a bunch of row houses and then apartment buildings. And um, so, so you're Glover Park, Glover which park. is Wisconsin, Upper Wisconsin, correct. And Calvert. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, and that, you know, and that neighborhood's also just like the rest of the city changed a lot over the years. You know, it was predominantly working class when I grew up. There were students and so forth, you know, but we've seen property values shoot up. And our co op has been able, it's a limited equity co op. So I don't know, Vernon, you've talked about those and you're a champion of those, certainly. Um, in this area. And so we've been able to keep our costs low. So we've got a fantastic mix of immigrant families. We've got elderly people. We've got people that have been there 30, 40 years. Okay, but you're going too fast. For me. <laughs> I'm way back on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, 77. 77. Yes, yeah, so I'm when I you, get a notice yeah, that says, you got to yeah. go. Yeah, Christmas right. Eve. Right, we're out. Okay. We're out. It's the middle of winter. And you have people there who, um, you know, and these are people that were already, you know, close in neighbors. And, so you know, your yeah. mom has two one-year-olds. Two one-year-olds. Single yeah. mom. Yeah. And she gets this notice. Yeah. You got to go. Right. We get, right. We're evicting you out. Right. Okay. Right. Now, th- did they have what is now come known as topa? Was that already in effect in you know, I think, 77? I think that stuff was just coming into effect, as I, as I understand it. Um, okay. And again, I you know we should talk. So Mayor and Barry, yeah, Mayor was, was, was a mayor. But yeah, and, and a big advocate, as I understand it too. Again, I was one year old, but I was trying. Yeah. I, you know, I've read about this. A huge advocate, you know, better than most. A huge advocate of of the affordable housing. Yeah, right, right. No, um, that's one of the things he put in place, which is one of the reasons that people loved him in the city. Uh, that he put those kinds of things in place to help people that was already here. So I have learned that there's other. States that are in big cities are looking at implementing something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. I mean, something like that was crucial for us. It allowed us, right, to be able to buy and stay and stay and stay. So there were how many units? How many buildings was it? That, that? Sure. Initially, it was ten buildings. I want to say probably close to maybe ninety units or ninety six units total. And then we, when they uh, downsized, bought out the owner, they. They transformed or converted six of the buildings. So now it's six buildings, about 63 units. Okay. So it went from you going to be evicted, kicked out in the streets or go find somewhere else. You got 30 days, 60 days, sometime to get out to ownership. Right. Right. And stay. Right. In a beautiful part of the city. I called it when I came here in 86, it was told me Gold Coast, anything west of 16th Street. And you're way up there <laughs> yeah. uh, and I have visited your property several times it's yeah. just beautiful yeah. and it's what they call garden type apartments because they're walk up three stories and it's solid brick buildings solid brick yeah solid brick buildings the bones are strong you know every time I have a con- I, I, I've been the site manager or uh, for four years almost now every time I have a contractor come they say you know they don't they don't make buildings don't like, build this. Them like this they don't anymore. build them like this now yeah and yeah. the Corps of Engineer having done it for the armory for Officers, uh, yeah, and so. administrative personnel. So yeah, okay. they're doing it for the you know these for the government essentially. Yeah, great story of turnaround. I'm going to get. I'm kicking you out. I'm the I'm the owner, and I have that right to kick you out to evict you, so I can tear these buildings down and build a high rise and make more money. Correct. The capitalist model. There's nothing wrong with it necessarily, except that the people that can't afford it are at the lower end of the economic ladder, then get pushed around. Right. Okay. Right. But in Marion Barry and the city council's view, they put in Topa uh, so that they get this opportunity to own it. And limited equity co-op just says, and and when I first heard about limited equity co-ops in about 94, I thought it was a way the white man was trying to tell the black man you can't make money because limited equity is just that. They limit the amount of money you can make, limits the equity. And I didn't like it at first. But when I hear stories like this, you had two options. You hit the street and go rent somewhere else or you own. Right. And if you rent somewhere else, you have no way of making any money. All of that rent goes out. Right. And then you're subject to the owner 
to the capitalistic, to the landlord. Right. And he can raise the rent whenever he wants to before rent control in the district. He can kick you out when he wants to. Yep. He can do whatever he wants with his property, right. which was the right. But then the city council and the mayor said, hey, let's give the folks that don't necessarily have any power power to have some control over their life, and we can do this in the form of limited equity co-ops. Exactly. So I love them now. When you look yeah. at limited equity co-ops compared to apartments. Correct. They're phenomenal vehicle. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's an ownership model, um, so we limit the equity, meaning we control. We control what we sell the shares for, not di- dictated by the market. We do that, one, so that we can remain affordable and approachable for people to be able to buy in. Right. But we also do that to keep our costs low, right? Our property tax is very low relatively, you know, compared to mm-hmm. other places. And so, you know, our, our demographic that we serve predominantly really appreciates that, just is really grateful to have housing that's a right and not as an investment. Yeah, a right, a place. And it's a beautiful place to, to raise a family and to grow up. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned property taxes are low. Yeah. There is a law in the district that says that if you're a limited equity cooperative, you are assessed the value of what they're going to decide how much taxes you pay on is the assessed value or the appraised value is what it could be called too. The assessed value is based on the amount of income that comes in, not on the market. Yeah. So a limited equity co-op in the district pays less taxes than a condo would pay or an apartment building would pay because it's assessed on income. Now, I have a 16-unit senior building that I manage because that's what I do in my day life is I manage. Mm -hmm. And that's why I learned about co-ops. 16-unit building in Shaw. So Shaw, when I came here in 86, was terrible shape. I mean, after the riots, I mean, there were torn down buildings. There was all kind of mess. But MANA came in and developed this Mm. 16 units, Mm. and then they sold it to the uh, several of the people that were there before when the apartment came back and then sold units to to, uh, other seniors. Had to be over 62, and at the time make less than $1,000 a month. Mm. Okay. Okay. That's the limiting factors. Gotcha. A one bedroom in Shaw was three hundred and twenty dollars. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And 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 this was eighteen years ago now. Mm. So that was still cheap, but today <laughs> yeah. it's up to three fifty, I think. Yeah. Um they yeah. haven't kept up with what their expenses are, which is a whole nother problem which we're dealing with. And uh I gotta give a shout out to Anita Bonds for the limited equity cooperative task force. And that's one of the things we're looking at. Uh, they could not raise their fees as much because they were all seniors on mostly on Social Security and they couldn't afford to keep raising them up to their to their expenses. But the city was great in keeping those property taxes down because if they had to pay property taxes on the market rate, yeah, that three fifty would all go to taxes. Yeah, there would definitely. be nothing else for anything else. Yeah, so they would have to raise probably double, triple their their fee just yeah. to pay the property tax. So yeah. this the city has been really out front and it's really a shout out to help people stay. But we need more. That's a whole nother conversation. Let's go back to Beecher. So we're going to have to take a break in a minute. And when I come back, I really want to spend time. You're telling us what it was like growing up sure. with these women that you, several of them you've already talked about. Of course. Uh, so there is a community, 62 families or so, 62 units, six buildings. And what that was like and some of the lessons that you learned growing up in the co-op that's helped you. You said you were one year old in 1977. Correct. So that makes yeah. you 40. 42, almost 43. Okay. So as an adult, how have what kind of lessons had you learned? And how have those lessons helped you navigate life as an adult? Be happy to. Okay. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM WOS at 95.9 FM. Information is power, and that's why NCB is sponsoring this program. NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for Americans Cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities. 
by providing innovative financial and related services. And they just do a great job of providing these financial services in low-income communities. And unfortunately, that's where you find a lot of black and brown folks in low-income communities throughout the U.S. So that's why NCB is sponsoring this program, to give you the information so you can locate a cooperative, whether that's a housing co-op or a credit union or a food co-op, to go purchase that co-op and make them stronger. Or you can start your own. You can start a worker cooperative. Three, four, five people come together and say you want to do X to solve some community problem. You can start your own cooperative. And today our guest in studio is Julian Rowan, who grew up in a co-op. And I said before we took break, I want to come back and talk to want him to tell us, like, how was it growing up in a cooperative in the district in the 70s and 80s? Yeah, it was um, it was a lot of fun. I have a lot of fantastic memories of like like we said six buildings um 64 units i have memories of my neighbors leaving their doors unlocked right so i would just my sister and i we would run into people's apartments and share in their meals so i had this feeling of an extended family a lot of black and brown people and immigrants in the cooperative again you know because mm-hmm. it was affordable to them and also welcoming um, and my mom did a lot of that welcoming. But I grew up with all of those influences, you know, learning to use chopsticks from foreign language students that were, you know, Chinese students that were studying at Georgetown to, you know, sharing meals from neighbors from Morocco or neighbors from, you know, uh, Arab uh, Israeli people and teaching me how to cook their foods. I just made this uh, Haitian, my Haitian fish dish that I learned from this woman, Josie, who was a Haitian immigrant, okay, at the co-op. So I wanted to share that with people at the co-op, you know. So I had this sense of an extended family, certainly, but also the example of my mother. You know, here's somebody who was essentially raising us on her own, single parent, always showed up to every every game, you know, and it helped that she worked at the co-op. So I, we could go home at lunchtime from the public you know, our elementary school, she was there, right? And we could come to the office. That's where she worked. Everybody knew that she was there. So it was the perfect job, too, for a single mother because she could work where she lived and didn't have to commute and could always be there to raise these these two kids. So I, I feel very fortunate, you know, and I, but I know that it was also, you know, difficult for her. She mm-hmm. took, on, took on a lot, not only as a single parent, but also, you know, as somebody who ran this co-op day to day and and took it on. So I also professionally have learned a lot of lessons from her and the the co-op too. Yeah. So your mother was what she called the resident manager. Yeah. She, I guess a long time she went by resident manager and then she started going by site manager. She was at the co-op again at, you know, before it was a co-op when it was back the Beecher tenant association, even, even before that she, let's see, Worked in the office from the beginning. She and Gretchen Wessel both volunteered, I believe, initially and volunteered their time along with the board. But they really, again, two powerful visionary women, um, working class women who did everything in the office and then also did all of the all of the maintenance, you know, or most of the maintenance, the stuff that they could do. (laughs) Right. So, again, like also seeing that example of you can learn how to do it yourself. You know, if if my mom can learn how to do most of the, you know, the basic plumbing and that sort of thing, it was an example for people at the co-op to be able to say, yeah, we can do this ourselves. And by doing it ourselves, we both keep our costs down, you know, and this is also out of the marketplace where it's also about relationships. It's about knowing what the needs are of the people there and my mom living there. You know, it's direct. She knows exactly what the people need, you know, so we're not having to to try to figure that out. There's a sort of directness in terms of relationships that, in my opinion, in terms of cooperatives, fall outside of that capitalist economic model too, you know, where it's really about people work. So you got people work on the financial side of it. What I'm, I want to take it down one more notch. So so you keep your costs down. Right. So your expenses are down because you're doing your accounting, you're doing your maintenance. Now they are paying her something. Yeah. But it's probably less than you'd have to pay a property management company, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, So you keep your costs down. And then because it's also a co-op, you don't have anybody trying to make a profit on you. Correct. So that's down. And so when you keep your costs down, that means you keep your rent. And I put rent in quotes because it's called co-op fee. 
In some cases, I've been told by one lawyer, it really is rent. You're, you, you, the landlord is the cooperative, and the people that live there have an occupancy agreement, which is like a lease that tells you what your rights and responsibilities are. So you keep your costs down, you keep your rent down. I'll use that word because most people yeah. know that word. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so it's a way that you can fulfill it where most tenants with the tenant mentality don't understand that. So they, if there's a water leak, they just may let it leak, not knowing that you're doubling the water bill, perhaps, or mm-hmm. tripling, if it's depending on how big the leak is. Exactly. Okay? But if you're in a co-op and you really learn that you're an owner and what you do affects your pocketbook and everybody else's, yep. you get a water leak, you call somebody to fix it, or you learn how to fix it yourself. Exactly. <laughs> okay? Exactly. It's an owner's <laughs> mentality. It's empowering. You know, it's empowering for, for people to know how to fix the, the, the small things that happen. And it's also empowering to be able to call somebody that they've known for, for years, you know, and say, hey, this is something that's, you know, happened before. Oh, yeah, this is, we know how to deal with this, you know, and it's somebody that lives, that's accessible. Yeah, it's, empower, it's empowering for people to be able to fix fix their own things. But also, too, it, it does hit the bottom line. You're able to keep your costs down if, if people practice best practices and, and such in the co-op and we communicate about that. Yeah, we can keep our costs down. Sure. And and if everybody's working together, I mean, this is the other thing, and Vernon, you've probably seen this too, is that we do work on such thin margins, okay, because we're a nonprofit. We're not trying to, we're not trying to make money on ourselves, mm-hmm. again, right, as self men We're all, own, we're, they were all owners there at the cooperative. So, right. So the, so the idea is that, yeah, this is, this is the place that we live. This is our investment. Again, not to make money, but to, 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 to preserve Housing is a right. And when when we when you have like we're seeing in the city, these housing pressures, right, when people um, expect something different from housing or uh, when people uh, will pull from that sort of collective resource of cooperatives, then you can have start having trouble. So it's also important for people to be on the same page, too, in terms of what the vision is and about supporting that kind of housing, affordable housing. That's all attitudinal. And if you can get that. Working together, yeah, which really gets to the ethical values of cooperatives, and I like them: honesty, openness, social responsibility, mm. and caring for one another. Yeah. So if you if you're honest and open, transparent, uh, like the financials, everybody in the co-op sees the financials, so you know that this how much was collected, this is what was spent on fixing water or on and on water bills, then you can see what's going on, and you can take appropriate actions, hopefully positive actions to keep your costs down yeah. and make it a great place for people to live. So, yeah, yeah I like the... Yeah. And, it, and it's the kind of place, too, where you where you have people and it attracts people um, that are visionaries. And I, and I want to sort of go back to the, the women at the cooperative. Um, so, for example, I currently live in a unit that was the longtime unit of a woman named Hazel Dickens. And Hazel Dickens uh, was a a bluegrass singer, but she was also a civil rights leader. She was uh, uh, helped unions, organizing with unions. She performed regularly at the Folk Life Festival. She performed with this woman named Alice, so Hazel and Alice. And she kept a real low profile, you know, working class woman, very humble, but also very committed. And the cooperative was an ideal place for her ideal place for her where she could she could she knew that the money you know that 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 she was putting in was going to a place right was not about uh was not about a rental situation um she cared about the people that she lived around she and my mother were good friends and this is the other part of a cooperative as you develop these relationships you know that go far beyond just sort of living next to somebody, um, it really does force people to come out of their doors, care for one another, care for the elderly people in our in our community. I grew up with block parties, you know, where people would come out, we'd, we'd, we'd cordon off the block and everybody would come out. So in, in terms of its effect on me, I mean, I've spent the last 15 years in the Bay Area doing advocacy work um, and organizing, community organizing and arts around displacement, you know, in the Bay Area where it's where it's extreme. And I think that experience of people coming together, people sharing, people caring about place and also taking a stand is, I think, is something that's really important these days in cities like San Francisco, Oakland, D.C., um, where people are saying, no, I care about 
this place. You know, we are we are owners here, and it, and it's that fabric of that I grew up around with these powerful visionary women creating community, establishing place, and being able to sustain and survive and thrive in this city and supporting others. I think is just um, it's something that we all need to to uh, really take heed of and recognize yeah. and honor. So were there a lot of kids in the co-op? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was, you know, I grew up playing with a number of the kids and eating dinner at their house. I mean, we, there was probably, you know, between five and ten kids, again, one bedrooms. So you have a, a lot of single mothers raising kids, you know. So we had that example of powerful women working full time. And we would also play, you know, together. They are very safe in the cooperative it's perfect also for single parents, too, right, to have that kind of community. It's fantastic, uh, phenomenal um, story. Uh, I'm going to come back. We could take another break, but I'll come back and talk a little bit more about the history and see if we can get some, pick out some of those lessons learned. Cool. We'll be right back. Cool. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative, and we have Mr. Julian Rowan as our guest. He's from Beecher Cooperative, which is over in Wisconsin and Calvert Streets uh, in northwest D.C., which I've been known as the Gold Coast. But you had everyday working people who came together to create a co-op, 62 units. 63 units. 63 units, six buildings. They were garden-type, walk-up buildings, brick buildings built by the Corps of Engineers, and they were going to be kicked out, and they decided to come together, form their co-op, and own their building, own their destiny, control it. One lady on the show, Julian, told me that uh, co-ops help people come out of poverty with dignity. Mm, I like that. Yeah, I had a gentleman the other day. He said, you know, when I came here, I felt poor, but now, I, but now I'm rich. That's it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that, that sense of accomplishment, the sense of, of self-worth. Yeah. 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 It, it brings out a lot of in people yeah. being able to control their own destiny and learn a lot about how to do that. Yeah. So you ran around with other young people <laughs> in the co-op. Yeah. You went in and in out of houses. Folks did not lock their their doors. No, not, not too much, I don't think. And folks shared table, the dinners with the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume you all did homework together. You grew up together. Yeah, I went on, you know, vacation together and stuff, you know, stuff like to, to Rehoboth Beach or things I, like that. You know? And I know you kids never got in trouble. Never got in trouble, not once, not once. Well, part of it is being accountable, right, to the people <laughs> that you're around. I mean, we were talking a little bit about that before. Part of being a community, though, is having that web of accountability. You yeah, know, the well, people would look out for you. I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia, and it was a community, but we live in different houses. But if we did something wrong, which mm -hmm. is climb up somebody's tree or take their apples or whatever, then the ladies out there that, that saw it would call my mom. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So how did they go about buying this place in 1979? They bought it. What were the steps that they went through? Yeah. I, I mean, as I, as I understand it, let's see. Yeah, the co-op got some some help. Um, they, they organized themselves into the Beecher Low Rise Tenant Association. Um, I know that Esther Siegel was really important in that for sure. And they got support and encouragement from DC council members. Um, I know Polly Shackleton was, was involved, you know, and city staff from the mayor's office. And they were able to form this partnership, I guess, to buy out the owner and, and also to do some rehabilitation. So right away, each unit, too, there was money for rehabbing the unit as part of this conversion. As I understand it, the cost of each resident of buying a share at that time was just $1,000. So, right. So, I mean, it's interesting. And, 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 and still today, you know, our share prices are right around $100,000 compared to about, you know, two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand 300000 that the one bedrooms in our in our area go for. And I gotta back you up. A yeah, sure. So there's there's seven cooperative principles: uh, democratic control, open membership. It doesn't make any difference about uh, 
your gender, your age, if you're a Democrat or Republican, it doesn't care about your religion. It just doesn't care. It's just open membership. Yeah. And that's why you had such a diverse range of people there. Yeah. Then there's a return on membership investment. There's some money you put in, and you were just talking about the membership fee of a thousand dollars then. And then it's limited on the amount of equity you can get on that membership. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is education, which is no, that's the fifth one. Education is the fifth one. Oh, the fourth one is you have to have control. Mm -hmm. You have to own it and control it. Yeah. Then the fifth one is education. The sixth one is uh, cooperation among co-ops that yeah. you want to look at how you can cooperate by other housing yeah. co-ops yeah. or credit unions or food yeah. co-ops. Yeah. And then you look at how you help to the community. Yeah. It's the seventh one. Yeah. Uh, and education is interesting because that is an ongoing thing. You really do have to educate membership about what is a limited equity co-op. How does it work? How does that equity structure work, right? Because we, we still see it year after year. We have some members and, you know, I mean, there are – and it does cut, you know, cut a claw across race and class, you know, honestly, that you have – you know, it, it, a product of whiteness, too, and ent entitlement and privilege where we do have members who either every year want to push us to go market rate con or, or condo. We have, you know, members who will take leadership positions and then, you know, decide, hey, I'm out and leave and go to some really high end place. Right. So, y y you know, you don't always have that that good fit. So so educational wise, we constantly have to educate our membership. Um, and other people about what is this about, you know, because it is different. It is a different model. So this education is ongoing. Yeah. And the Rothdale principles, that's, uh, I think it was 1844 uh, in Rothdale that they created these seven principles. Are these, mar these principles came out of what they created. And they told me back then when they talked about education, they were also talking about reading and writing. They were talking about not mm -hmm. only the the education of how, what is a co-op or a limited equity co-op in this case, how do they function, how do you resolve conflict, uh, how do you read a financial statement, uh, how do you make decisions in this democratic control, how do you run meetings. All of these things are more directly related to how you run this business called a housing co-op. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. And how do you do it together because you don't have somebody over top of you, landlord, capital, somebody, the massa. Yeah. Telling you what to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So you have to learn how to do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Vernon, in the spaces I've been around with you, you've been a champion of like, how do we get training for these amazing people, right, who are volunteers, primarily the board, you know, the board people are all volunteers um, and who are also working full time. And, and I think you've been a, a champion at, at, at from what I've seen and really looking at how do we train and educate and support you know, those people. So I really appreciate that about, about you and your, your commitment to LECs. Well, the, the reason uh, I, I've spent 12 years as a teacher, 11 of those 12 as a college professor. Mm, cool. My mother taught school. She mm. went back to school when I was and graduated when I was 13 with six kids. Wow. Okay. Wow. And so she was, my father only had a eighth grade education, mm. a lot of common sense. My mother had the book sense. Mm. So together they made a pretty good couple. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're common sense, met yeah. book sense. Yeah. But um, there was my grandfather said to me, sober or drunk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Get an education, boy. Get an education, boy. Get an education, boy. That's the only thing that mm. white man cannot take from you. Mm. Mm. Okay. So mm. education was all throughout our the mother, dad, grandparents. Everybody was get an education, get yeah. an education, get an education. And so then I taught, and I came to realize. That, that education is one of the key, if not the main key, for getting people to come out of poverty. Yeah. People that are that, that may be blue-collar workers but don't have a full scope of how you run a business, and they can get this in co-ops. That's why I like co-ops. Yeah, I, listen, I have to, again, sort of credit my mother and to, and to say, here, you know, we're working class. You know, she I think she was even on some sort of support, you know, government support the first few years when she was volunteering for the co-op and raising us. And I, and that's how she was able to do it. I was know? on food stamp when yeah. I was at Stanford. Yeah. Oh, wow. I couldn't pay. I came away with debt. Wow. wow. But I couldn't pay the bills. Yeah. 
And one of the other students, the black guy, said, hey, man, you know, you qualify for food stamps. Wow. And I never wanted to be on food stamps. I never wanted that. But I thought there's a time and place. Oh, yeah. Need, need help. Yeah. And it's, I mean, and in, in, in growing up at the co-op, it, it provides that structure for, for help. So, for example, a member at the co-op went to one of the private high schools in northwest D.C. He was fortunate. And he was an athlete, and he saw me dribbling a basketball when I was like eight or something like that. Invited me to the camp at one of these private schools. And after going to uh, to summer school for three summers and going to the camps, they invited me or recruited me to go to this private school. So then I went to this all-boys private school. I went to the top liberal, at the time, top liberal arts in the school in the nation, you know, and then, you know, did a lot of years of grad school. But school? I, I, I would have never, I what's would have never. What's that top school? Uh, Amherst College okay. in, in Western Massachusetts. And so you would have never gotten that if somebody didn't reach out a hand. To... No. And and the stability, too, of the housing, right? It, that housing provided the stability for my mother to be able to create that container, you know, so that I could have that educational opportunity, right? So it also meant means a lot to me. It meant a lot to me to be able to say, hey, I've learned this much, and I had that opportunity from being in this housing community, this cooperative. Obviously, it's affected me because I went into advocacy work. I went into housing work, community work, you know, and to be able to come back to D.C., to be able to, you know, work with people like you, too, on, on, at the city level, to be able to work with people that help raise me on the day-to-day level. I mean, I'm essentially like a social worker, and that's what my mom, that's sort of part of this model is that so much of it is about interacting with people on a ver- very personal level. Well, you talk. what I talk about is you, you get wealth by being in a co-op. You get financial wealth because you do put something in, and when there's a surplus or there's some in this limited equity, there is some equity that comes back to you. Yeah. Okay, so you can create financial wealth because you couldn't get in an apartment. Yeah, building. or savings. You can save money. Yeah. Yeah, I tell people if you're smart, you save you save money being there because you don't have to pay. You're not throwing money out the window in repairs and stuff. We, we take also care of that. learn how to save. If, yeah. you, if you really get into the business of co-op, yeah. You learn that that's one of the things that people group as a group learn how to save money. My, my mom's a penny pitcher. That's how they have reserves of over a million dollars. Penny know? pitcher. Pincher. Penny. Yeah, penny. penny pincher. Yeah. <laughs> She's okay. frugal. She's frugal. <laughs> they call me cheap. But okay. <laughs> frugal, okay. frugal, frugal. My kids call me cheap. <laughs> well, okay. Honor, I'm trying to honor my mom. I know. <laughs> Okay, she's, she's, uh, so but you yeah. learn this in 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 the, in the co-op, and then if, therefore you can take this on to your lifestyle for sure to to learn how to to get the most out of every dollar you hold on yeah. to. Money seems to be come can come in, but it goes out faster. I don't care how much you have <laughs> coming in. Yeah, it, it seems to go out faster yeah. if you don't learn how that. But I had a lady; she was a German lady, five foot tall in heels. And it was a co-op in Newport News that I managed for a couple of years. And she, limited equity co-op. And she said that people always tell me, you can't make that much money. She said her return was all three of her kids mm-hmm. went to college. Mm-hmm. They were saved money. They sent all of their kids to college. And they all had great jobs. I think one was a doc- medical doctor. One was a lawyer. I forgot what the third one was. They're all yeah. professional folk. Yeah. Okay. And they're yeah. doing quite well. And that was that was what she talked about is what you can do in a co-op is really learn how to save money and then really help your kids. Like you said, you've been to graduate school. You've, you've been doing this stuff. Yeah. No. I mean, it's... Uh you know, to go back to, again, the, 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 the women that I grew up around and the women that I see every day at the cooperative, you know, I have to acknowledge the, both the privilege, right. That, that then the education that I was afforded also being a man in a space. I, you know, my mom, I don't think would feel comfortable coming on the radio. She's, you know, a quieter person and just wants to go about the work every day. I've asked her before. Right. So, so I, so I also have to, and I feel responsible too, to, 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 to speak up also for the people at my co-op who are, are every day and who have been putting in to this co-op now for decades, you know? And so, um, just an honor to be able to, to, work with them and to also to honor them. So we're going to take our final break. It, comes, it goes by very quickly when you're having fun. <laughs> and I thank you for being here. Cool. Thank and you. then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about the co-op and a sense of what is happening in the city with the LECs cool. 
that Anita Bonds had put together, the Limited Equity Cooperative Task Force. You're not on it. I am, but you come to all of the meetings so I'm, and give a lot of input. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we get Sounds back. Good. And what's, what's happening in the future for Beecher Cooperative. Yeah. We'll be right back. Bank sponsors this program. And, you know, we, we talk about how you can get information, how you can get knowledge to help you solve your own problems. Yeah. Okay. And this is what our guest, Julian, is talking about as he grew up. He's now 42 years old, almost 43. He was one year old when they, they, they started this process of buying their cooperative. Uh, they bought it in 1979. He grew up there, got educated, some great education with what he has learned in the co-op and the people in the co-op and the opportunities that he was given, got some graduate education, and then he's been out, and now he's back to D.C. So, Julian, you had mentioned a couple ladies. Yeah. Okay. And and you mentioned one that was a singer. Yeah, Hazel Dickens, yeah. Okay. So any others you want to talk about and what kind of roles they played, and particularly in terms of this non-violence is a way of changing society. Well, sure. Yeah, there are a number of people that come to mind. I, I, and somebody that you know as well, Roseanne Look, was a president, board president at Beecher Cooperative, uh, still continues to work with Mon- Mana, and um, talk about a really powerful person in the city. I know that she was instrumental in starting a couple or, 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 or helping a couple of limited equity co-ops she was the board president there for a long time. Just talked to her the other day. Uh, again, Gretchen Wessel, long well, time. Let's talk about Roseanne yeah, just sure. a little bit more. I mean, yeah. I got to know Roseanne when I first started a property management company in 80 and 93. So I probably met her in 94. And I had just found her a very calm, cool, yeah. get it done kind of person. Exactly. Exactly. And she used to take my sister and I when we were little to go and help paint. You know, she's... On the weekends, I remember going with her and helping to paint some of the, you know, developments that they were working on and stuff, too. But has that kind of right. Just get it done. No nonsense. Um, but, yeah, so reasonable. She always takes a back seat. I mean, you, she's not out front. Yeah. She gets it done from the back seat. And I I talked about Je- Dr. Jessica gordon Nimhard's book, Collective Courage. And she was saying in the white cooperative world, women were all, always in the back. They were the ones doing the work. Yeah. And the white men were the ones in control. Mm. But in the black cooperative world, women did both. <laughs> they were out front. Yeah. Okay. And here, um, Nanny Helen Burroughs is a good example in Washington, D.C., back in the day of creating co-ops and being a leader and getting it done. So women, Roseanne is a perfect example of she's a white woman, but she gets it done and I almost think she doesn't want to be in front because it seemed like I've always thought she could have be running man if she wanted to or some other. Well, one. yeah. And I, I think that's, you know, you, I've seen that at least across the board with a lot of the people and that tend to be a lot of women in the, in this sphere, housing and cooperative sphere that, yeah, don't want to, uh, you know, be in the limelight because what they're about is providing that direct service to people, right? That's what's important. D- getting those services, i.e. housing, which includes all kinds of services directly to people. So if that's your focus, it does, you know, you don't all, then I think being more of a public figure or being more uh, running for an office or something like that, I could see how that perhaps could detract from that if that is your focus. Yeah. So yeah. I get that. I get that. And I mean, we've seen a lot of, I've, I've been very blessed in the last four years to, to, to go to a lot of the, co-op meetings and workshops and stuff and you could you could probably attest to this too by and large i see you know a lot of women 
So mm -hmm. I would say, you know, 60 to 80 percent of the, the people that are in those spaces or organizing those spaces, powerful women, black and brown women in the city. I've had the good fortune of, of working with like Ajwa, um, who's helping to organize a LEC federation. Lolita, uh, Lolita Ratchford has been really sort of visible. I know that she's newer to the area. Amanda Huron. Uh, when I moved back, talk about somebody, a visionary in D.C., an organizer, but somebody, too, an academic. She's an educator. An educator. Right. Yeah, and just somebody that's really – and she lives and works in an – I mean, she's on the board of an LEC. But um, I want to shout out one other lady, Annie Hill. Annie Hill, yeah. Annie Hill from the district. She's the president of her – Co-op, housing co-op, but she's also the president of the Potomac Association of Housing Co-ops and on the board of the National Association. And she's been the president of Potomac uh, 8, 10, 12 years now and done a, that's a fantastic job. Mm. It just, and there's a lot of women on that board. I was mm. on it for a couple years, mm. but they just get her, they get it done. Yeah. And there's, I've, I've met a, a countless number of older African American women in the city who have been running. Don't say that about Annie. She will come and talk to you. Many people. <laughs> 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 Our kidding. elders are wise. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. And then, you know, I've had good fortune of working with Louise Howes, you know, on this, or just meeting her and been able to just witness some of the great work that's happening, you know, part of with, with your leadership on the subcommittee, but also the task force, the LEC task force of the, the city and Ellen Zerberg, um, fantastic people. She's at Mikasa, Jade Hall, at Housing, Housing Counseling, Counseling Services, Services and, and Sue there as well. Just a really amazing women that have been really present. And, and again, I, I've been back here since being, you know, doing advocacy work in the Bay Area, but I've only been back here four years. And these are the people that continually show up, you know, for limited equity housing co-ops. And I just really uh, honor to know them. So let's just, I'm going to go back a little bit on the sure. limited equity co-op task force was yeah. something created by Anita Hill. So there's yeah. a, there you a go. woman yeah. that is getting things done and she sees Somewhere she's gotten this this sort of this touch of vision, the knowledge about how limited equity co-ops really, really perform and outperform apartment buildings. And she's put together this task force to see how we can preserve the co-ops, about 100 co-ops, limited equity co-ops in the district. Uh, we figure about 3,200 or so apartment buildings, families, if you will, that live in these uh, 3, 000, uh, 100 uh, buildings. And so she put together how we can preserve these because it's a great way of having affordable housing year in and year out, and then how we can develop more, which I find a, a very exciting uh, possibilities of getting more. We were talking, we, we've been meeting now for about six months, and last night we were talking about maybe we could have a goal of doubling the number of units in the city in the next five years. It's about 600 a year. It's a, perhaps a goal that we can start shooting for and getting the training and everything that we need to get. But you mentioned Louise Howe. She's a, an attorney, like you said, with UDC. They have a clinic that helps these limited equity co-op. Ellen is just superb. I yeah. mean, I, I think she works. I don't know if she works less than 80 hours a week. I, don't, I can't see how she can get everything done if she gets done <laughs> working less than that. But with Mikasa, and Mikasa has been around as a developer now, and she's taken a very active role in all of that. And they provide training. Then you mentioned Jade Hill, but uh, there's Miriam. Oh, yeah. Miriam yeah. Siegel, who's, mm. the, who's the head of Housing Counseling Services. Sue Chen is yep. at Housing Counseling Service. And now Jade is, is running and doing a lot and doing a lot of the training. So you have all of these groups that helps the limited equity co-ops, and we're trying to get them more, more stable, perhaps more money, so we can even yeah do more. And, it, and, and those are right, and just like you mentioned, those are women that are um, doing a lot of great work, um, and also probably more visible. Um, and limit, and again, Anita Bonds with this vision sees that how do we support women? Again, there are a lot of women running and so these LECs, these affordable housing models that work. How do we support them? How do we right. support those women, right, that are also working full-time jobs, volunteering or, you know, and working raising a family and, and raising a family and are central members of the community? Because that's also part of what happens is, you know, my mom is so tied in 
to Glover Park. You know, she's known by everybody in the area. So what you have there is that that area where people who have lived in those communities in that community, for example, 30, 40 years are known by people. That's the fabric of community right Right. there. You know, and those are women that are that are keeping that institution, that organization, those that cooperative together. And so it's really exciting, right, to see your work, for example, with this initiative by the, by Anita Bonds to figure out how do we support those people at, at that very basic resource, housing, you know, that, that stability so that then they can help support our communities, which they have been doing. So I'm going to give my last comment, and then I want you to say a comment, and we only have about a minute left cool. here. Congressman Ellison, I think is his name, said something once that a, a house – is similar to a bowl when you're baking a cake. He said, try baking a cake without a bowl. I mean, you crack the eggs, without the bowl, what do you do with it? Okay, you put the flour, you, how, how do you mix everything together? Said, Basically, you can't. He said, if you don't have a house, some one-bedroom unit or some three-bedroom house or whatever, how are you going to raise a family? Yeah. You have nowhere for the kids to do homework. You have nowhere to have dinner and to talk and to commute. He said without a home. So it's really, really basic. Yeah. So we need more houses. What's your last word? My last word, one, I just wanted to share my appreciation for somebody I work with, Leah Brown, who is another visionary woman, powerful woman that is holding it down at my co-op. And I just wanted to say thank you to my mom. Um, she was an amazing hero of mine, and also thank you on behalf of the co-op because she really has impacted positively the lives of these people for four decades. So, yeah. Thank you very much for being on. Everybody out there, we we'll see you next Thursday. Please live this week cooperatively. Thanks. News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, 95.9 FM.